The once upon a time opening of Un Chien de Loup was meant to lull us into fairy tale receptivity. The footage of scurrying scorpions that opens L'Arge d'Or transports us not to Neverland, but to some documentary space and time that is undefined, but hardly surely an age of gold. What this start does establish is the clinically distanced position which the film will take thereafter towards its human protagonists, lovers and love's enemies alike. The opening segment borrows entomological factual footage from a pre-First World War popular science documentary. The old film stock is fuzzy and the framing erratic, but by the same token, it's true to Bunuel's and Dali's anti-artistic impulses. It places all that's to follow in the framework of natural history or image fact. This start is perhaps underwhelming by comparison with the first films, but its provocative significance accumulates as the film progresses. We see the scorpions fighting among themselves and repelling an intruding rat. It's immediately clear from the laconic intertitles that what the documentary identifies as the instinctive behaviour of the scorpion, its venomous aggression, its survival capacity, its treachery to its own species, applies equally to humankind. The scorpion is the zodiac sign that governs the genitals and the anus. As such, it's the symbol of sex, excrement and death. Thus, this opening sequence introduces the ambivalent dynamic that powers our impulses of attraction and repulsion alike and officiates at the alchemical marriage of shit and gold. It's also the avatar for the startling diegetic ruptures which the film has in store. It warns us that the film itself will behave like a scorpion and mimic the shape and function of the scorpion's tail formed, quote, of a series of five prismatic articulations ending in a sixth vesicular joint, the poison sac. The film also will be an organ of battle and information. It, too, will deliver its most provocative thrust in its last segment. The warm reception of Un Chien de Loup by Le Tout Paris was both a blessing and a curse for Dali, Bunuel, and surrealism generally. While not going as far as to court martyrdom, the movement was ambivalent about success, especially commercial success. Its popularity implied that it was too easily recuperable by the establishment. Bunuel wasn't going to make the same mistake again. If un chien de loup can be dismissed as poetry or a dream, its successor is stubbornly unclassifiable. At just over an hour, it fits neither with the arty short nor with the conventional feature film. While Un Chien de Loup is a darkly shining emblem for surrealism's adventures into the unconscious, L'Arge d'Or is perhaps the most trenchant and implacable expression of the movement's revolutionary intent. It's thus bizarre that this desperate and sustained revolutionary manifesto was funded by a wealthy aristocrat. The opportunity to make a second film arrived hot on the heels of the success of Un Chien de Loup. It came in the form of an invitation to Bunuel and Dali in November 1929 from the Vicomte Charles de Noailles to make a sequel, this time a talkie, for the birthday of his wife, Marie-Laure. Noailles had already established himself as a Mycenas to the avant-garde and had recently commissioned a short film by Man Ray. His wife was a modernist poet in her own right. Marie Law was also a direct descendant of the Marquis de Sade. The private commission suited Bunuel very well. As an intending professional filmmaker, he needed to build on the reputation so recently acquired. Initially, it seems that L'Arge d'Or was meant to be another short film, employing some of the gags that had been left over from its predecessor. Its status as a sequel was signalled in its original working title, La Bête, Andalouse. The novelty was to be in the soundtrack, making it, with René Clair's Sous les Toits de Paris, one of France's first talkies. 
During the winter of 1929-30, the script of what was eventually titled L'Age d'Or grew exponentially, with the generous compliance of its noble sponsor to justify the final 63-minute feature. It came out way over Noailles' original budget at about eight times the cost of Un Chien de Loup. It was shot in three weeks at the same Biancourt studios, filmed, it was claimed, in a state of euphoria, enthusiasm and destructive fever. The contentious issue of the respective contributions of Bunuel and Dali to both our films is too complex to be addressed here. Suffice it to say that their relations during the preparation of L'Age d'Or were now a lot less harmonious. The earlier rapport had evaporated. Dali's input was not as significant, though it was a lot greater than early commentators allowed. It seems that Dali's mind was elsewhere. Gala had recently come into his life. Bunuel loathed this surrealist muse and groupie with the same jealousy as he'd earlier shown towards Lorca. Financial difficulties following the bankruptcy of his dealer forced Dali's absence from Paris. He forwarded ideas to Bunuel, perhaps a whole film script, much of which, however, Bunuel did not use. The film, as eventually realised, in terms of its narrative structure and ideological position, was largely the work of Bunuel alone. Subsequently, the power fell out over just about everything to do with L'Age d'Or. Dali publicly disowned it on the grounds that Bunuel had totally betrayed his intentions, replacing his own, quote, authentic sacrilege with a primary anti-clericalism and an over-explicit political message. Whether Dali liked it or not, L'Age d'Or is a textbook, almost a catechism, of the fundamental tenets of surrealism in perhaps its most incandescent period. In the frankness of its eroticism, for instance, it coincides with the group's ongoing researches into sexuality. While keeping faith with Breton's dictum that the surrealist erotic should be veiled and not porno-realist. The film chimed also with the group's most dedicated efforts to reconcile the worldviews of Marx and Freud in terms of their shared diagnosis of an incipient cracking beneath the surface limpidity, the discreet charm of the bourgeois order. The film's anti-clericalism follows the anarchist line that religion is an agent of all repression and coincides with the Surrealists' militancy at the time within the Communist Party's front organisation called the Anti-Religious Struggle. With all this going for it, unlike its predecessor, L'Age d'Or received the group's imprimatur before rather than after the event. Their collective declaration saluting the film's release read... This is the indispensable moral complement to stock exchange panics, whose effect will be very direct precisely because of its surrealist character. Bunuel seems to have been determined to banish all equivocation about his demoralising intentions in the second film. Clarity, method and calculation presided over the preparation of the scenario with little or no automatism and at the expense of spontaneity and dream. Correspondingly, the film style of L'Age d'Or is largely functional and unobtrusive with limited camera movement and little trick photography, as if to give it the authority of a documentary. Out go the iris effects and slow-motion shots of Un Chien de Loup. Avant-garde fast cutting the average shot length in the first film was three seconds, gives way to a more normal take length of five and a half seconds. If un chien de loup plays on the opposition between sight and blindness, then the corresponding duality in large d'or is between gold and shit. The psychoanalytical, an age-old linkage between the basest and the most precious of substances is the most likely key to the film's title. 
Those who sell their souls to the devil find that the gold he gives them in exchange eventually turns to excrement. It seems certain that the title was lit upon out of surrealist contrariness by antiphrase. It's a contrary title in another sense also, for the argument of the film seems to be that each age of mankind's history repeats the same clash between impulse and inhibition. The deliberate flattening of temporal perspective emphasises that this is a film about our condition in the here and now. Both films tell the story of thwarted passion and explore the mechanisms that cause love to fail. Both films have bookend opening and closing sequences, prologues and epilogues, from which some or all of the main protagonists are absent, sequences that bracket the central narrative and comment metaphorically upon it. But L'Arge d'Or differs in many important respects from its predecessor. The second film stretches its canvas way beyond the fated romance of a single couple to reach out to the world at large and the cultural history of the West. It takes in both the internal struggle between Eros and the death instinct and the external one between individual desire and the social order. The targets of its satire are explicitly social even if the root causes of some of the dysfunctions examined may still lie in maladjustments of the individual psyche. From the standpoint of a surrealist revolution, the nagging question that hangs over L'Arge d'Or is whether the supreme egotism of the sexual drive we see in action, at once frustrated and destructive, is specific to a society in decomposition, one that revolution might cure, or an ineradicable fact of the human condition. Does our corporal finitude and our conflicted psyche ensure the disappointment in advance of all our aspirations towards a golden age? It's been noted that L'Arge d'Or lacks the formal unity of its predecessor and comes across as something of a heterogeneous collage. Certainly, there are striking shifts in mood between lyricism and derision, romantic exaltation and objection. And the film willfully mixes genre, fiction and documentary, pseudo-historical reconstruction and contemporary melodrama. It travels between diverse geographical locations as prodigally as a James Bond movie. But it would be a mistake to dismiss L'Arge d'Or as just a collection of disparate gags. There is a powerful internal logic behind Large Door's juxtaposition of contraries. Once again, privileged images, hanks of hair, agitated fingers recur. Patterns of opposition and reversal, along with repeated strategies of interruption and delay, all serve to hold the film together. As in Un Chien de Loup, but on a bigger scale, the discrete parts resonate together, share a consistent ideological texture, and express a singular, overall, cruel vision. This famous sequence resumes the lyrical communion previously established between the lovers still parted by circumstance. It has been hailed by surrealists as the ultimate screen representation of the power of l'amour fou, the potential for subversive and reciprocal desire to overcome all obstacles. It attains a poignant sense of consummation in a movie which otherwise chronicles, comically and desperately by turns, the repeated frustration of such desire. The woman is now sitting at her boudoir mirror, apparently dreaming of the lover from whom she has been so officiously separated. Shots of her buffing her nails are intercut with shots of Modu still being bundled along by the two policemen. The mirror plays its traditional metaphorical role in poetry as an agent of magical mediation. 
a complex soundtrack merging noises from the two unrelated locations proclaims intersubjective desire's triumph over separation. There is the ringing of a cowbell, which belongs to the woman's space. We've just seen her shoe off the cow, and we assume it's still close by. Mingling with this is the angry barking of a dog, running along behind the railings of a park, excited by the passage of Modu and his minders. Finally, there is the noise of a high wind, which appears to blow through the mirror itself, as if it were a window onto a blustery day. The woman's hair is ruffled by the wind, the very gust of desire. The man and the woman appear to exchange a tender regard, their eyes filled with tears. The communicability of such desire is expressed with a persuasiveness that owes much to the perceived mimetic status of the soundtrack, then so novel and so innocent, to enhance film's realism. Yet, at the same time, the mise-en-scene defies the canons of realism. A close-up of the mirror reveals not the woman's reflection, but passing clouds. With perverse inconsistency, however, the mirror does reflect the perfume bottles in front of her on the dressing table. The two contradictory representations of the mirror are held in suspense to the end of the sequence when Lise rests her cheek against its surface and turns her gaze towards us while the wind, blowing through the glass, continues to ruffle her hair. L'Age d'Or excited little of the breathless enthusiasm that greeted its predecessor, but the effectiveness of its bite was speedily confirmed when it reached the public screen at the end of November 1930. While it was as far as one could imagine from communist propaganda, its revolutionary purpose could not be mistaken. For once, surrealism found itself taken seriously, perhaps as much because the political climate was changing as for the incitement of the film itself. At the start of the 30s, with the Wall Street crash and the mounting threat of Nazism in Germany, the après-guerre gave way to the avant-crise. The authorities began to make life more difficult not only for militants but also for irksome poets. Word of mouth in extreme right circles soon put it about that here was a film made by two shameless metèques, people of mixed blood that brazenly insulted religion, patriotism, the family, in short, all things dear to right-thinking Frenchmen. And this, at a time when political argument was settled with walking sticks and fisticuffs on the streets. Stormtroopers from the Ligue des Patriotes and the Ligue Anti-Juive broke up a performance. Choosing the moment when the monstrance is removed from a limousine and dumped on the ground, they began shouting, We'll show you that there are still Christians in France, and death to the Jews. Then they threw ink over the screen, let off smoke bombs, and wrecked an exhibition of surrealist paintings in the foyer. In the following days, L'Arge d'Or became a cause célèbre, une affaire, in the tradition of the Dreyfus Affair. The entire Paris press rushed to take sides. Dali and Bunuel became household names. On the right, the newspaper campaign took up the civil disorder as a pretext for banning the film. Typical was Gaëtan son voisin in Le Figaro, quote, There's no denying the political intent. This is a very special kind of Bolshevik effort. Yes, really special that's out to rot our moral fibre. Galvanised into action by the outcry, the Censorship Commission withdrew its earlier visa and ordered the seizure and destruction of all copies. Now I, who had managed to safeguard the negative, was blackballed from the jockey club. There was even talk of a papal excommunication. The surrealists played the scandal for all they were worth. 
16 signatories launched a protest questionnaire addressed to fellow intellectuals, declaring that the abuse of police power was both a sign of the advancing fascization of France and proof that surrealism itself was now seen as a palpable threat to bourgeois society. We've reached the anticipated poison sack in the sixth and final articulation of this Scorpion's Tale of a film. It's also a bookend epilogue to match the entomology essay at the start. But for the finale, we're in pornography mode, not documentary. We're below the snow-wrapped Gothic fortress of the Duc de Blangy, de Sade's monster of libertinage from Les Cent Vingt Jours de Sodome. There's a logic to this apparently arbitrary leap from Rome 1930 to a Sard castle in that Modo's final eruption of rage finds its match in the unrestrained aggression of a Sadian libertine. A lengthy pseudo-moralistic intertitle scrolls up to warn us to expect the appearance of the castle's depraved aristocratic residents debauched by weeks spent inflicting sexual cruelty. But when the castle door opens, it's the bearded figure of Jesus Christ who is the first to emerge. The lechers who follow him out are as exhausted as he, brothers in their decrepitude to the earlier bandits, perhaps. Their departure is delayed by the unwelcome emergence of one of their hapless girl victims who has somehow survived their murderous paedophilia. Christ, Blangy, maintains his inanely angelic expression throughout, whether his face is bearded or, disconcertingly in the following shot, clean-shaven. He goes back into the castle to finish off the wounded Nubile. Her dying shriek echoes Lealise's earlier cry of passion from the bed of mud. The implications of doubling our saviour with a serial killer are dizzying. It takes provocation to the limit, but there's yet another twist in store. In an ultimate pirouette, the castle view dissolves to a snow-covered crucifix in close-up. The incessant calander drumming on the soundtrack gives way to a sprightly passo doble. From the wooden cross dangle half a dozen apparently female scalps, certainly those of the dukes, Jesus' victims, swinging in the wind. Would Bunuel have us believe that because repressive denial breeds violence, the self-proclaimed religion of love has always really been an infernal machine of female sacrifice? Or are they so many more swatches of women's hair that reprise yet again the primordial and irresolvable Eros-Thanatos dialectic that has ricocheted throughout the film.